Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a webinar this afternoon hosted by Onset. The title of today's webinar is Utilizing Data Loggers for Agricultural Research and Environmental Monitoring. Uh, my name is Ellie Snyder, and I'm going to be the main presenter today. And I'll be joined today by Paul Gannett, who is our principal product manager for the question and answer session. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started with today's webinar. And we will hold questions and answers for the end of the webinar. Okay, a little bit more about myself. Uh, I uh, work here at Onset as a sales development manager with a focus on the higher education market. Um, uh, within this, uh, I work a lot with land grant institutions and also agricultural producers. Uh, my primary product focus is in the Hobo Connected products, which serve agricultural and environmental research applications. Uh, my background is actually in agronomy. Uh, I worked uh, in agricultural research and extension, in addition to agricultural production, prior to joining Onset. Um, I became familiar with Onset products because I, I actually utilized them in my extension work, uh, serving apple growers in the region where I worked. Go over a few webinar logistics today. So the webinar today will last about 45 minutes. Uh, we'll save 15 minutes at the end to answer questions. Uh, you can answer, or you can enter your questions at any time in the questions box. Uh, there's a, an icon of that on the right side of the screen, and you should be able to pull that up and, and enter your questions there, but we will answer them all at the end. Uh, this is being recorded, and we will make it available to, to the attendees. We also have a number of webinars that are available on the Onset website. So a little introduction to Onset itself. Uh, Onset manufactures Hobo data loggers. Um, so it's uh, focused on uh, creating accurate and reliable data logging and monitoring equipment. The company is located on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Um, Onset has, and was founded in 1981 and is a world leader in data loggers with a global network of distributors. Uh, we do our, all of our manufacturing and engineering in-house, so these are Made in USA products. Go over the agenda for today. First, we'll talk about some uh, data logger basics. So what is a data logger? What are the components? We'll cover what to consider when selecting a data logger. Uh, we'll go over some of the Hobo data logger products. Um, today we'll focus mostly on the outdoor and ter terrestrial line of products, but I'll briefly uh, mention some of our outdoor and water products as well as indoor products. And we do have webinars on those, focusing on those products at other times. So if those are of interest to you, be sure to look out for uh, notices about upcoming webinars uh, that cover those products. And I'll cover some tips for planning your data logger design and deployment. Okay, so what is a data logger? Um, basically, there are two components to uh, most of the products that are manufactured here as data loggers. There's a sensor, so the part of the product that actually measures uh, something that, you, that you're that you trying to capture. And there's a part that stores that data and transfers it. Uh, so, uh, for example, on the left, you'll see um, sort of a white box with cables connected to a soil moisture sensor and also a temperature sensor. So this is a combined soil moisture and temperature data logger. Um, and uh, the, the white case with the button and it says soil moisture and temperature, uh, that's where the data is stored. And that also contains the transfer mechanism. Some of them, uh, such as the blue uh, hobo pendant that you see, have uh, internal sensors. So you may not see the sensor uh, separately from the data logging piece of it. They may be housed in the same uh, container. Uh, 
some, some things that you need to consider when you're selecting a data logger. Uh, what do you want to measure is the most important. Are you trying to measure temperature, relative humidity, wind speed? Uh, do you need to measure something in the water? Do you need to, to measure um, uh, rainfall, uh, soil moisture? There are many different things you could measure. So that's the most and first, the most important and first thing you should think about. Um, next, consider where your data loggers will be deployed. So there are certain data loggers that are designed for indoor environments and applications and also outdoor applications. And as I mentioned earlier, there's some designed to be used in water and different levels of salinity within that as well. So um, that's that will lead you to um, a certain set of, of loggers that are specially designed um, to be utilized in those different environments. Something else to consider is data access. Uh, is remote access to the data necessary? So do you need to see, to be able to see the data if you're not on site where the data logger is present? Um, it may not be practical to travel to the site to offload data, it's another consideration. So consider um, if that's practical and, and if so, um, how frequently you could access uh, that data or, the, or access the logger. Um, consider who needs access to the data and when. Uh, and then something else to consider is if the environment where you're deploying the data logger has some kind of connectivity, whether it be an internet uh, service or uh, a cellular service. So in the next section, I'm going to introduce some of our Hobo products that are uh, suitable for outdoor and terrestrial applications. Uh, as I mentioned, I'll focus more today on agricultural applications and environmental applications, and uh, we'll highlight some of the products that are utilized in those areas and also talk about how they function. So some examples of applications um, might be climate, Research, uh, crop and livestock research uh, are very popular. And then um, the pro the, many of these products are also used in agricultural production. Uh, some examples of applications in that realm are frost alarms or temperature monitoring, um, soil moisture and temperature uh, metrics that can help to um, just inform irrigation management decisions or planting times. Uh, other applications include uh, using the data to run disease and insect models um, to help predict infection events or, or an insect life cycle. So within the outdoor products, there's a few different uh, series. Um, there are some, and these, these differ based on how you offload the data. So uh, the standalone products here are um, accessible with a USB offload. So um, you can deploy these alone. Um, and then when you want to or need to access the data, you have to return to the logger and actually plug it in um, and access the data with the USB offload. The next, uh, next column of products are mobile device products. So these are, these are um, products where the data is accessed uh, with a Bluetooth connection from a mobile device. And on the right, there are, there's a series of cloud-connected products. So these uh, products feed data to the cloud via a cellular connection. So uh, going over some of the outdoor applications again, briefly touched on those, but uh, weather and climate data is, is um, very popular use of these products. Many of the outdoor products are very rugged. They can withstand extreme temperatures and climate conditions. And so even if the data can't be accessed frequently due to lack of cellular connectivity in a certain area, um, these loggers will withstand those conditions and continue to collect data in, in extreme environments. In agricultural research, um, it might be used for um, collecting weather data at a research site or monitoring soil moisture uh, conditions um, under various um, microclimate conditions or, or irrigation management protocols. 
Um, they can also be used to help develop agricultural models. So um, having consistent weather data in, in a location um, that's easily accessed and validating models um, with that weather data is, is certainly a, um, a useful um, endeavor with these with these type of products. In production, um, agricultural producers are using uh, these tools for uh, again temperature monitoring. Um, sometimes, sometimes they might be used for frost alarms, um, alerting um, of a frost risk uh, in a certain location, or it could be a high temperature situation, perhaps inside a greenhouse or a high tunnel. Um, they might be used to monitor soil moisture for irrigation purposes. Um, they can be used to help um, in site selection for a new uh, planting of something. So uh, monitoring uh, microclimates, um, frost pockets in a new area, uh, or monitoring soil moisture to assess the risk of um, soil-borne pathogens developing in a certain area can help producers uh, decide if a, if a site is appropriate for planting a specific crop. Um, tools are used to monitor light intensity and photosynthetically active radiation, so um, helping uh, especially greenhouse growers or those modifying the environment to assess whether um, there's sufficient light for producing a crop or if there needs to be supplemental lighting in a certain situation. Uh, light intensity can also be used in um, some crop production models. And as I mentioned before, um, they can the data from these outdoor loggers can be used in disease prediction with appropriate models, as well as insect life cycle tracking. And they can be fed into degree day models uh, to help um, time management practices in different crops. So to go over a little bit more detail, some of the loggers that are available uh, and I'll group these by data offload. Um, the outdoor USB loggers, um, these include uh, an individual or a micro station. So this is a central data logger that can connect to uh, many different sensors. And again, you would offload the data uh, with the USB. Um, there are also individual loggers um, that can be placed uh, alone. Uh, to monitor a specific area and again offload the data uh, with a USB. You have to go to the site and, and physically collect the logger and offload the data that way. Um, some of these can be very low cost and very convenient. Um, they're ideal for remote situations where real time or remote access to data isn't necessary. Um, these do require a software uh, which um, uh, it's called Hoboware or Hoboware Pro, depending on the particular uh, sensor that you're using. Um, you you might use one of these two softwares, and um, within that software, there are some different capabilities, uh, such as a growing degree day model and other um, graphing and manipulation that you can um, explore uh, with the data through that software. Um, this is one of our uh, lines of outdoor Bluetooth loggers, um, and these are these are again they've got different sensors attached to them. Some have internal sensors, and some have external sensors, and they again can be deployed individually, like the standalone uh, USB loggers. But you offload the data with a cellular device. So the MX2300 series, which is pictured across the top here, uh, include an internal temperature and R rate and relative humidity sensor. Um, one that does uh, temperature and relative humidity but has an external sensor that's wired to the data logger. One that does two uh, external temperature and RH sensors so you could place the sensors in different locations if you wanted to measure say temperature at a different at two different heights in a certain location. There's also uh, soil moisture and soil moisture and temperature Bluetooth loggers. These tend to be ideal for um, test fields or greenhouses, um, perhaps monitoring um, temperatures uh, in, a, in a smaller farm situation where you're visiting frequently. You can access that 
that data with a, a mobile device uh, every time you go by, um, check on the current um, conditions or offload data from the previous day, um, and help make decisions that way. Um, this is ideal, again, for uh, a remote location also, where you only need to go and access the data every so often. Again, not, um, not something where you want to have remote access to it. There are also other um, Bluetooth loggers. So we have um, tidbits. These are um, some of these can be deployed underwater and um, and also in soil, and so they're sort of a lower cost solution um, for monitoring terrestrial um, situations. So again, these Bluetooth loggers are pretty easy to deploy. Um, and uh, you offload the data via a, via a free app called Hobo Connect. So you can download the app, and in that app, um, uh, it, the app should uh, recognize a Bluetooth logger that's within range, um, which is approximately 100 feet away from the logger. Uh, from the app, you can program the logging interval. You can also program the start and stop time of logging and you can uh, adjust the data storage settings. Um, and then when you're ready to export the data, you can do that as a CSV, uh, Excel, or Hobo, .hoboware file if you're using the Hoboware software. Now I'm gonna move on to uh, the outdoor web-based loggers. Uh, these are uh, data loggers that can connect to multiple sensors and they uh, have a cellular connection feature that provides automatic data offload and remote data access. So you can communicate with 5 to 50 sensors depending on the model. Um, these are ideal for crop monitoring, using data for predictive models, and for setting alarms that you want to receive uh, remotely. There are a number of different sensors that can communicate with these uh, data loggers. So there are wired sensors which plug in to the actual loggers. They need to be deployed close to um, the actual logger. Uh, the cellular data feature of those uh, of the central data loggers means that you can place them uh, basically in a convenient location close to where you want to have these wired sensors um, measuring um, the environment. Um, in other words, they're not restricted by having to have access to an internet uh, connection, so uh, Wi-Fi or Ethernet is not required. All you need is a cellular data plan. So the wired sensors include temperature, relative humidity, um, PAR, rainfall, wind speed direction, soil moisture, um, solar radiation, leaf wetness, barometric pressure, pulse input, uh, 420 milliamp input, and 0 to 24 VDC input. And there, uh, the wireless sensors um, can do um, all of these as well, or the or most of these, um, except for a few differences on the bottom. Uh, there is a multi-depth soil moisture and temperature sensor available here. There's also a uh, line of soil moisture, uh, soil moisture and temperature, soil moisture, temperature and EC, and then um, soil water potential sensors that are available as wireless. So how do these wireless sensors communicate back to the main data logger? Basically, the sensors are connected to uh, one of these uh, kind of white colored boxes. And inside of that, that has the data logger, and it also has um, the ability to send data back to the main uh, central data logger station. And uh, this, is, a, this um, is possible through a sub gigahertz wireless, met, wireless mesh network. So it's um, communicating with this main data logger um, through that um, through that sub gigahertz network, and it's a self-healing network. And so, if one, uh, they can communicate through each other, and then it's a self-healing network. So, if one of these goes down, um, 
another one can find a way through another sensor back to the main uh, data logger, or it can go directly to it. These can communicate back to the main station through up to five hops, uh, and they do repeat off of each other. Um, there are also repeaters available to extend the range of, of the wireless capability. So again, these are the sensors that are available um, with, with that wireless capability, also known as HoboNet. Temperature, temperature and relative humidity, solar radiation, PAR, leaf wetness, pulse input, rainfall, wind speed and direction. We have an ultrasonic wind speed and direction, uh, multi-depth soil moisture, and several other um, soil moisture uh, wireless sensors. Um, to access the data, uh, you can use an online-based um, software interface called HopoLink. You get access to this as well as storage, as well as your cellular connection by purchasing an annual data plan. So um, in HopoLink, you create um, login information and you can um, set up your um, uh, station at the time of deployment, uh, entering serial numbers and um, as soon as you're connected, if, as soon as you start the cellular connection, um, you will start to see these populate and, and hobo link and you can program them here. Um, so when you log in, you can see information uh, such as the last connection time, uh, the strength of the connection of the of the hobo net connection. So between the actual sensor and the data logger, battery strength. And you can see if there's anything um, of concern or if the, if the actual um, sensor is in alarm state. And you can program um, each sensor to send you an alarm or send you a notification if it, uh, based on cert certain thresholds, if that's of interest. For example, low temperature, low, low soil moisture, high wind speed, etc. You can create um, customized dashboards uh, that make it easier to visualize the data. So um, in the dashboard feature, you can choose what sensors you want to show here. And um, if you want them in graph form or, or how, how you'd like to view them. Um, you can also share this through a public link uh, with public URL and post that somewhere if that's of interest. Um, or you can share that with others who just may have interest in seeing the data, other researchers, etc. There's also a map mapping feature in HoboLink. Um, so this is an example of um, what a HoboNet uh, wireless, wireless deployment looks like. Um, the central uh, blue box that says Kuna Meset, um, that is a central data logger. And you can see the different sensors that are placed around this farm. Uh, there's an icon that indicates the type of sensor, and then the latest reading will also show up in this mapping feature. You can also export data from HoboLink. Um, so if you would like to download a um, certain set of data from this that's been collected by uh, a particular logger or sensor or all of your loggers, um, you can do that, and it's very customizable. There's also one data feed uh, that's available to set up through HoboLink. Um, this um, can feed uh, data to the Network for Environment and Weather Applications, which is a website hosted out of Cornell University. And um, the website has many different crop models. So um, on the right, you can see a list of some of the Apple models that are available. Um, for anyone to use on the new website. They take local weather station data and, um, and then you can uh, often pair that with some local observations and run a model to help you with disease infection event prediction, uh, insect uh, life cycle timing, uh, crop management decisions. Apples are just one example of a crop um, that that NUA has models for. There's also vegetable models, uh, grape models, conifer models, corn models, and others. Um, they do have a growing degree day model as well. Um, 
on the NUA website. But you can also take that data and um, plug it into uh, your own model if you have them not accessed through here. Um, this is a this is an interesting feature um, because in in some situations one person one farmer or one um, research station or one extension office will have a uh, weather station that's feeding uh, data to NUA and many growers in the area can use it for different applications even if they're not using or even, even if they're not growing the same crops. Um, you do have to have a certain set of, of sensors to feed data to NUA um, but again this is um, you can also access the data uh, again through specific queries that you may be interested in um, depending on your research interests. So um, there's some uh, important design and deployment considerations. Um, it's good to uh, be familiar with the terrain where you're going to be setting up your system to help you decide whether or not uh, a hobo net system is appropriate or um, how many repeaters you may need or where you're going to place sensors, etc. Uh, it's good to know the number and types of sensors required um, before you design a system. Um, and in some cases, you, um, you may consider whether or not one system is sufficient. Uh, again, HoboNet sensors can make up to five hops back to the main station. Um, they should be communicating uh, about 1,500 feet line of sight, um, or you could extend that a little bit if you raise the moat height. So um, as I mentioned before, I was going to focus on the terrestrial products, but I'll briefly mention some of the water products. Um, some of the common applications for the water products include monitoring water temperature, water level, and water quality. Um, there are different data offload options for the water products. There are some um, where you manually, manually offload with USB system, others uh, that you offload data with Bluetooth, and then there's some remote monitoring options as well. Some of the um, common, common metrics are um, water level, water temperature and light, um, dissolved oxygen, there's pH, and conductivity. And Hobo makes a line of indoor products. Um, these are often used to monitor the indoor environment or air quality, um, energy use, and HVAC efficiency. So again, these loggers are designed to be used inside. Um, there are several versions of standalone products for different metrics, uh, as well as those that are Bluetooth enabled or mobile device uh, connected products. One unique um, feature of the uh, Bluetooth indoor products is that there is something called an MX gateway and this actually collects data from the Bluetooth um, products that are within range and can feed them to the cloud with an internet connection. So the MX gateway is ideal for uh, when there's multiple sensors being utilized inside um, to avoid having to individually collect uh, and offload data from many sensors that are within a small um, area. The HoboNet um, line is also can also be used inside. So um, that wireless wireless mesh network of um, different sensors um, can be connected to a HoboNet station, and um, similar to the outdoor application, um, can monitor different areas um, within a certain range. So um, it's important to point out the water products and the indoor products, even though it's mostly talking about agricultural applications. Um, water certainly can be a concern if you're monitoring water quality um, uh, in irrigation water or, or water level in a well or a pond. Um, and then the indoor products might be of interest for storage facilities, um, for livestock housing, um, and um, and so, uh, you know, these, these products are, while they're uh, often used by different markets, um, they may be of interest in agricultural applications as well. All 
Finally, some tips for planning um, your data logger purchase and deployment. Um, recommend obtaining product information and estimates before submitting grant proposals. Uh, sometimes uh, someone is knowledgeable with the different products out there uh, can help you select the best uh, setup for your situation. And um, it's sometimes difficult to estimate, you know, what the actual cost may be. Um, if you're not familiar with, all, with what all products are available and what would be best suited for your site. So I definitely recommend reaching out to Onset or Hobo or whatever um, uh, data logger you're, you're looking at and, and consulting with a sales representative um, in that grant application process. Um, something else might be to coordinate with others on research on a research project uh, to promote consistency in your data collection and data logging. So uh, if you have a multi-state project where um, you're monitoring the same thing across different locations, um, it's good to um, get on the same page and, and make sure you're um, collecting a, a compatible set of data that can um, give you sort of standardized information across, across different sites. If you're at a research site where there are multiple researchers doing different projects, you may coordinate with others uh, to see what they uh, may need in terms of data logging capability. Um, perhaps you can share equipment, share uh, one of the Hobo Net weather stations, um, save some resources by sharing that equipment, um, and um, also make that available for others to use in the future. And the last suggestion I have is for um, is to plan for flexibility and longe longevity of use. So if you are planning a, a data logging deployment uh, for a research product that you have coming up soon, uh, but you know you have different research goals long term, um, you may consider investing in a more robust uh, setup in order to enable you to do your long term research goals um, with the existing equipment. Right. and that wraps up the presentation for today and now uh, we'll open it up to questions and Paul Gannett will join me for the question and answer session. Hello everyone, uh, glad to be joining you today to uh, address some of your questions. Um, I want to thank those of you who sent your questions in advance and we'll probably start out with some of those questions first. And then uh, we'll address some of the questions you've been sending in uh, during the presentation. So uh, let me uh, bring up some advance. And, and I'll be asking the questions. And then between Ellie and I, we'll be answering those. So the first couple of questions I had were in regards to costs. Um, and uh, it's a very legitimate uh, uh, question to get a sense for uh, what kind of uh, uh, pricing we have just to give you a sense. So the first one is, uh, what are the most robust and cheap humidity and temperature data loggers and sensors to install in a field experiment? You want to uh, throw out a couple options there, Ellie? Or yeah. Um, so uh, field experiment with temperature and relative humidity. So a Bluetooth. You, again, the, the question here is sort of a do you need um do you need remote access to data or or um, can you uh, go off of the data with Bluetooth? Uh, certainly, some of the Bluetooth um, temperature relative humidity loggers would be appropriate. But then, if you wanted remote access, you could consider um, one of the cellular cloud connected systems. Sort of depends on your setup and um, if you're monitoring a number of different sites that are close to each other within range of that HoboNet. Um, network then that might be a good option um, but if they're far apart from each other and you just have one area that you're monitoring that's several miles from another then perhaps the bluetooth option would be better yeah just to add some specific dollars behind that the uh, uh the uh the hobo mx uh 2300 series data loggers uh that ellie mentioned earlier the the temp rh model of that sells for under 200 dollars it's 190 dollars to give you a sense of very uh, low starting point for those loggers and it's uh, the app uh, the Hobo Connect app for those is free so that's a, a great 
entry point and they're very robust uh, designed for field use. In, in terms of web-enabled stations, uh, those start in the $1,200 price range, including a temperature sensor, uh, it's just kind of your base, most basic uh, system, uh, just a temperature sensor, and that includes a data plan, uh, as well as the integrated cellular communications to get the data up to the internet. So that just gives you a, a little sense for you know, basic starting point for standalone and uh, web-enabled stations. Another question, this one is a little bit more complicated, but uh, we've got a, uh, it is a fairly common question, is can the sensors be recalibrated when moving, and the follow on to that is when moving sensors within the field, is recalibration necessary? And actually, Ellie, I think I'm a, uh, I might be better suited to answer this one just because uh, this is getting into a little bit more of the details and uh, uh, I'm, I'm a little closer to that. And that is uh, the answer on recalibration really depends on the sensor. Um, many of our sensors uh, hold their calibration for multiple years uh, and they don't need to be recalibrated, like temperature sensors. Uh, they're very stable over time, so they really don't need a recalibration. We do have the option in Hobolink, you know, which is the web-enabled interface, that you can add an offset and multiplier to adjust your data. If you do happen to notice that there's been a drift up or down in your temperature measurements, for example. So all of our sensors have that uh, ability to be uh, linearly adjusted to correct for any drift over time. And some of our sensors, like the rain gauge sensors, they have screw adjustments that allow you to uh, adjust the calibration on those. So, um, you know, that's just kind of gives you an overview of, uh, of the, the sensor calibration. You know, for obviously for specific sensors, you know, we can, we could, that you're interested in, we can address those separately. Let's see, here's another question we get. Uh, data collection where there's zero cell phone service, uh, but we can do 900 megahertz radio links. We also have some Wi-Fi available. Uh, what do you suggest for that, uh, Ellie? Um, I guess uh, if, if you don't need, um, if you don't need sort of access to real-time data, then uh, one of the USB stations could be appropriate um, but the, currently we don't have a, a Wi-Fi enabled version of our RX stations what would you add Paul yeah yeah a lot of our uh, our users are uh, deploying our, our loggers in, in remote environments where they don't have cellular so it is pretty common uh, you can use our either our standalone loggers or our standalone stations uh, and uh, off of the data, either via USB or Bluetooth, depending upon the logger. So, you know, that is a very common common thing. Because a lot of the climate change that's happening that the people are, are studying is uh, in remote environments, such as the Arctic. So, uh, yeah, and yeah, that does mean you have to go get out there. But the loggers are designed to, to last for a year uh, uh, off a single set of batteries or more. And that allows you to, uh, you know, deploy them, you know, through the harsh winter season and go back and retrieve the data uh, the next season if, if, if you can't get out there uh, more frequently. Next question. Do you have a solution for measuring low-level inversions, possibly a 10-foot mast with a second temperature sensor? Want to talk about that one? I'll let you talk, talk to that one. Okay, yeah, uh, that, this is not as common a question, but uh, it's pretty easy to set up a station with multiple temperature sensors. So, uh, uh, especially like in frost management applications, frost alarming applications, it's quite common to, to look for those inversions. And also in spraying applications, the uh, inversions are important because that can sometimes trap uh, some of the, the overspray at ground level and, and cause it to spread more. So um, yeah, you just have to 
have a mast with the temperature sensors mounted at multiple levels, and you can have as many temperature sensors as you have input channels. So our typical stations will accept up to 15 temperature sensors, which is which is more than enough for for temperature inversions. So yeah, no problem. Okay, the next one I have is uh, how can I share the map in Hobolink with the RX 3000 sites to the public slash farmers? Talk about that one, Ellie. Yeah, so in Hobolink, you can create a public URL and then also customize what people see with that. So um, they can see the dashboard or they can see um, the map with the current conditions or they can see uh, the actual list of different sensors and their latest readings. But they can't um, access the rest of Hobolink. In other words, they won't be able to go in and alter uh, any of your settings or logging intervals or anything like that. All right, thanks. Um, so far, I'm going to switch gears now to some of the questions that have just come in uh, during our session. So uh, let me address some of those. Um, I may have missed it, but what's the range of the mesh loggers and probes? Can you make sure you re repeat that? Yeah, so uh, the range is generally 1,500 feet. Um, so that should be line of sight. In other words, um, not really with major obstructions in between. They can travel through some some canopy and foliage um, and some obstructions, but a, like a major building in between uh, might encourage the, the network to, to go around uh, the building. Um, and then uh, if, you, if you place the most a little bit higher up, so I think you said maybe above six feet, Paul, is that right? You can you can extend that range a little bit, maybe up to 2,000 feet. And again, they repeat um, to up to five hops back to the station. And there are repeaters. Um, if you struggle with some connectivity between those, um, you can always add a repeater later on to a system. All right, thanks. Next question, um, and actually I think I'm gonna take this one because I'm just more familiar with this software. What is the easiest way to view real-time graphs of Hobo Connect sensors? You know, the ones with the Bluetooth communications. And uh, there's actually a, uh, you may have noticed it in the screen when uh, Ellie showed it for the Hobo Connect software. There's a live data a viewing option when you're connected to the logger. So that's very handy when you're on the site and you just want to make sure you're talking to the right logger. You want to you know, make sure it's responding appropriately. You can view that data uh, live while you're 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 there at the logger. So good question. Um, and here's a question just for clarification. I mentioned the uh, I'll read it. Is the twelve hundred dollars for the web enabled unit and data the cost for one year of data service? And uh, I'm glad you asked for um, the clarification on that. Yeah, that's that price includes the first year of data service. Then the reoccurring charge is typically uh 199 or 299 depending upon the level of service plan that you uh, subscribe to and you can change it year to year too depending upon uh, if your needs change or not now here's just kind of a, a general question it's something good to be aware of is there currently a wait time to get the modules and equipment or are most units readily available to ship you want to address that yeah um the with the uh, the cellular stations so the the rx stations uh the ones that can have the hobo net capabilities and also those plugged in um sensors there's currently about a three to four week lead time on those uh, next question can the wireless bluetooth temperature loggers read through the walls of freezers and uh I'm going to take this one too because I have a little bit of firsthand experience there. <laughs> um, it depends on how uh, thick the metal is. B Bluetooth doesn't like going through metal, but it can go through uh, uh, metal, especially if you're close by. And I have actually deployed our, our hobo uh, uh, loggers with the Bluetooth in like my own freezer to, uh, uh, to check the temperature when the, uh, the power was out to make sure that it didn't get too warm in there. And, and for, for, you know, this is just obviously a home freezer, but uh, it had no trouble transmitting the Bluetooth through the uh, the freezer to um, 
you know, so I could read it out without having to open up the freezer. So it, it might require a little bit of experimentation. If you've got really thick walled freezers, it's probably not going to go through those. But if you've got moderate uh, wall thickness, you, you probably can go through it. So other questions? I think we've covered. Oh, I should note, I see a couple questions in here about our water loggers. And I, I, I think we'll follow up with a view on those questions independently, like you know, some of the details of, of using our conductivity data assistance. Uh, we do have other webinars that, uh, that cover that, so you can refer to those, but we'll make sure to have somebody uh, follow up with you individually on those, just because those are kind of a whole different uh, ecosystem of, of using loggers. I mean, it's a lot of the same software, but it's really off topic for this webinar. So I didn't want to make you think that I didn't read your, your question, but I, I do want to def, uh, defer that. Uh, and here's here's a question. Just uh, who can we contact at Onset for help with the design of our, our, our system? And uh, well, I'll, I'll point you to uh, Ellie. She's, uh, especially in this field, she's a great, great uh, person to reach out to. And she's included her email address here. So uh, uh, feel, you know, especially in the fields that she mentioned of environmental research and uh, uh, agriculture research and agriculture in general, she's, she's glad to help you. But also feel free to reach out to uh, us by email uh, at, at any time, call or email us. Uh, all the contact information is in our website. I, I actually, I'm going to put in a plug for our website because it is a really valuable website full of a lot of resources. And a lot of times you can get your questions answered there, but uh, you always feel free to call us or, or contact us by email and all that's on the website. Let's see. I think, what else? Oh, here's, uh, I'm just, I'm sorry, I, I'm just having to read these, some of these live. Uh, oh, here's here's a question. Is it possible to turn off the Bluetooth of the sensors to reduce signal interference? And yeah, I, I, let me address that one again. It's more of the loggers that I work with is the uh, standalone uh, Bluetooth loggers. Um, they, they have a mode where you just, you know, you can turn off the Bluetooth communications when, uh, you know, during logging, and then you just have to push a button on the logger to turn on the Bluetooth communications when you want to connect to it and offload the data. But that will allow you to uh, turn off the Bluetooth for most of the deployment, save some battery, and it also avoids the chance that uh, it could interfere with um, uh, other equipment in the area. But the Bluetooth is pretty low power, and we do test our loggers so that it that that Bluetooth isn't going to interfere with other equipment in the area. So it's usually not an issue. Let's see, okay, we're good. We're getting some more questions. Uh, this question. Uh, okay, this is, some, some, uh, thank you. Somebody just pointed out that the, uh, in Ellie's email address on this slide, that there's a, a hidden underscore <laughs> between Ellie and Snyder in her email address. So make sure to, to type in that underscore so that uh, if you're trying to reach out to her. So so thanks for that, uh, David. Um, and I got a question here about mixing sensors, water and indoor on the same recording logging home station. is. Um, yeah, I, I think I understand the question. So, um, yeah, you can mix the sensors. Uh, you know, uh, you know they can be outside, inside, uh, water sensors all feeding into the same central uh, RX station or with the wireless. So, I, if that doesn't answer your question, Stephen, uh, feel free to to follow up. I see also that we're just about. Uh, through our time here, I think we allowed what 45 minutes. So thanks for those of you uh, that, that hung in there. So 
let me, uh, at this point, I think we've gone through most of your questions. And again, I will, for some of the, the detailed questions, we're going to follow up with you individually. So um, let me turn it back over to, uh, uh, to Ellie to close us out. Thanks, Paul, and thanks for your questions. Uh, as Paul mentioned, we'll we'll follow up with any unanswered questions, and also um, you'll you'll um, be queued in uh, to some of our um, onset emails and um, informed about different events, uh, webinars coming up based on your um, product application that you specified when you signed up. So um, if you if you did include other questions, we will certainly follow up with you. And um, thanks again for attending.